Well, hello. My name is Tanya Yoon, and I am excited to be here and excited to, that you've come and to be presenting on this topic of, topic of intergenerational ministry. Um, just as we get started, I've put handouts on your desk. I'm not necessarily going to read from those. That's for you to take with you. You can look through it if you want, but we're going to be touching on a, a number of things. And this workshop will be interactive. So I'm hoping that you will participate. If you have questions and things you want to know about, um, please feel free to jump in at any time. But I'd also like to invite you, you have a blue card on your table. Um, that is for you right now. If there is a particular issue or question or topic that you came to this workshop hoping that we would cover, I invite you to write that down on the card now and then bring it up to me and just put it, let's just put it up on this desk and I'll take a look at them and, and as we're going, hopefully we're going to be covering what you're asking, but that'll just help me too to know what the, the different issues are. But again, feel free throughout this hour to ask things as we're going also. So just as you're writing down your question, and please come up whenever you've gotten it written, don't, don't worry about that. Um, I want to share just for a moment uh, intergenerational ministry, my passion in this. And I'm not sure, maybe we'll learn as we go through this hour uh, why you're here, but I uh, probably about, I'm going to say about seven years ago now, maybe seven, eight years ago, I really started to catch a vision for intergenerational ministry. So my background right now, I serve as the Children and Family Ministries Associate for the Canadian Baptists of Ontario and Quebec. So I'm in our denominational head office. My role is um, resourcing and supporting our children's ministries and family ministries within our churches. Uh, so there's a lot of things I do with that. Prior to stepping into that role full time though, and along with it, I have served in three different churches here in downtown Toronto as children, youth, family, some combination, uh, doing that in, in the churches that I, I've served in. And um, really my passion, my heart when I started out in ministry training was for youth ministry, youth and young adults. And I did a lot in youth and young adults. And that's where I always felt like that's where I'm, I'm called to. But in every church situation and maybe those on staff, uh, I went in as the youth person or, or something like that. But children's ministry was always something that was ended up being part of my role for whatever reasons. And so I was kind of always put into children's ministry. And as a teenager, I was in children's ministry because that's what you do with teenagers. And so I've, I've always been a part of children's ministry. But probably about seven, eight years ago, there was something that in me switched. And I've now focused my time all in children's and family ministry, and particularly around this whole idea of intergenerational ministry um, and intergenerational worship. And so this time, we're going to talk about those different things and they're different ministry events intergenerational ministry events and intergenerational ministry are two different things but they're they're part of this whole intergenerational um, topic so we're going to spend some time talking about that but I'm so passionate about that one because I think it's biblical um, that was something that was really um, uh, so obvious for me once my eyes were kind of open to it, um, but also because it is incredible what happens when you have multiple generations together, worshiping, learning, um, uh, engaging with scriptures together. It's incredible. And for me, the other piece of that was to really have my eyes open to the, the spirituality of children. That when we don't see that or aren't a part of that, we miss out on the fact that kids, there are incredible, incredible things that God is doing in and through the lives of children. And we, um, as generations that are not children, whatever generation we might fall in, can learn so much and can be drawn to God and have our eyes open in so many ways when you have multiple generations together. So I'm so passionate about this, and if I could, I would mandate that all churches are intergenerational all the time for different things. Um, However, having said that, that's not to say that I don't believe in different generational divided teachings and times of worship. So let me clear that up too. Like it's not that I'm saying you throw out all of those times. We need those segregated times, age groups for different learnings and different reasons. Um, but we also, we need to combine that with, with opportunities for intergenerational relationships to form in worship and in study of scripture. Um, we are gonna spend our time here talking about 
uh, two different aspects. And so I'd love to know where more of the interest is. So when it comes to intergenerational ministry, we can talk about events and things that you would, you would plan, programs that happen outside of like a Sunday morning worship service. We also have the aspect of intergenerational worship, which is more in terms of an actual worship service or a Sunday morning, a family service, something like that. So I'm going to take a few minutes to just talk about both of these areas, and then we'll move into actually doing some practical hands-on things in groups. So I'm going to give you some work to work on. So there's your other heads up for that. So I'm going to start with uh, intergenerational worship. This was something for me that was really uh, that really opened my eyes up in a new way. So uh, intergenerational programming, that was one thing that I kind of got and had seen in different ways. But intergenerational worship, so Sunday morning when you have everybody there, that was something that for me really was an eye-opener and, and I guess a game-changer, you could say, for me and how I did ministry and what I wanted to focus on. And I want to start this section just with reading this quote. I'm not sure if anyone has read this book, All Age Worship, or is familiar with Lucy Moore. If, you're, if you do messy church stuff you would know her um, but this book um, I read this when I was starting to explore all-age worship it is it is really good it's one I would recommend uh, reading if you want to talk about what it is but right in the introduction she says it's time to be real it's time to admit that worship with all ages present is easy to do appallingly and difficult to do well it's time to acknowledge that it takes a huge amount of grace from every participant but it's also time to admit that a church that unthinkingly packs off any subgroup, old or young, to worship and learn in another space every week could well be as daft as a person merrily cutting off his own leg. It's as ridiculous as that. That quote, that's a pretty jarring quote, um, but for me that really stopped me. I actually posted on Facebook and it generated huge discussion uh, among people. But that really, I thought, that, like, I like that quote. It's really powerful, um, and it's, it's quite jarring in its description, but it's true. What are we doing when we're sending, and most of us perhaps experience that we send the kids off. Maybe they're there for part of the service, and then we do a story or a prayer or something like that, and then we send them off to their own junior worship or to Sunday school or to something like that. And the other, the other thing that was going on in my life at this time was thinking about those kids who are getting to the age, whatever age it might be in your church, where they have to now stay in adult church and they can't stay in children's programming. That is a very difficult transition and a difficult period of time. And so all of this was swirling around in my head and I thought, yeah, what are we doing? What are we doing right from a young age? We're sending kids off and doing their own kind of tailored program. And then at some point, whatever the magical age is, we say, now you're done with that program, all geared towards your, to you and all fun. And you have to come and sit through what we determine to be the proper adult worship. And what are we doing to prepare kids for that? What are we doing all along the way? And what are we doing to their own spiritual lives in the, the way that we're designing our environment to exclude them for a certain amount of time and then say, now you have to stay here. So for me, this started me on a journey of looking at that. And I'm not going to go through all of the notes, but I really think that we have to, as a church, and perhaps you don't have all the say on the worship, the Sunday morning worship service, but I think it's a conversation that churches really need to have in terms of worship. And let me say, it's not just something that is about the children, having the children in worship. It's really a bigger worship question in terms of how do we consider inclusivity of all the different ages. Um, because what often happens is that we lose people on either end of the spectrum. So the young kids we lose, but there's often seniors that we exclude too because we just, we don't want to listen to what they want. So we're aiming at some demographic, but we're often, oftentimes what happens is people at both ends of the age spectrum don't get considered in how we do worship. So what I want to say in terms of um, intergenerational worship is that it doesn't have to be, it doesn't have to be complicated. It doesn't have to be a lot of work. Um, what I started to do in the last church that I served in and as I helped churches is to look at your 
order of service. So whatever it is that you do normally week to week, we all, whether we're a highly liturgical church or not, we all follow generally in our church services a general order from week to week. You might change up things, but rarely does a church service look entirely different every single week. So I encourage you, if you're looking at this intergenerational worship, take a look at your service order and start to look and think through ways to be more mindful of how is that including different people? How does that include children? How does that engage people at different levels? Um, so that's, that's just one quick tip, I would say. There's so many small tweaks that we can do that would make a huge difference um, in including um, people at different age levels. Uh, something could be as simple as using uh, simpler language explaining things. So perhaps there's one word, there was a discussion that happened one time among um, some of our leadership team about the word benevolent. Do you use that word? Take a benevolent offering? That's a, that's a beautiful word and it means something beautiful and there's not really an equivalent that we could replace it with that's just as lovely. But it's a word that so many people have no idea what it means. <laughs> And, and maybe adults too, but children too, that we just use it. We're taking the benevolent offer and we're taking it. So the discussion happening was, I think we should drop the word benevolent and say something different because that's just, that's just, that's not a word that anybody knows anymore. But somebody in our team actually said, I don't know if that's the right response. I think we need to teach what benevolent is because I think that's actually one of our words that we use in church that's beautiful and has depth and doesn't have an equivalent that I think we need to actually look at teaching that rather than just saying, assuming people know. And that's something that I want to say could apply to many things. I think that there are aspects in our worship that we want to keep because they are beautiful, they're unique to our Christian worship experience that we don't want to necessarily throw everything out. But are there ways that you could bring in um, ways that would bring everyone on board. And this might be helpful, not even just for children who are learning, but for adults who've come to faith later in life, to adults who've sat through church but never knew the meaning of different aspects of worship. So I think that one starting place, one simple way, is that you can just start to look at what are you doing in your service and how does it include different people. If you, um, so you can have, so family services, the whole service is geared for everyone to be a part of. Um, that's something great that can happen. Uh, we can talk about that more in a minute, but there's also the opportunity that you have if the children are there for a portion, to really focus in on that portion that they're in the service. Are you being very mindful and intentional with how you plan that time that children are there? So that could be anything from the songs that you select. What songs are you, are you choosing? Are they songs that kids are, are singing and can be familiar with? Any of us in, in worshiping, how much, more, um, uh, how much more do we enter into worship when there's a song that we're familiar with than when it's brand new? Not that we don't have brand new songs. You want to mix in brand new songs. But if you're a worship leader, you know that it's not wise to introduce a set of all completely new songs. On a, on a Sunday, because then nobody's really worshiping. There they're might be learning songs that might be great, but they're watching a performance. The same with when you have children there. If they're always songs that the children are never hearing or they don't hear again, so they're new songs every week in that portion, then that's, that's not gonna help them to enter into worship. Maybe you might wanna consider songs that they're singing in their children's time, incorporating them into the beginning part of worship. Are there other ways? Are there other, I, I encourage, um, you know, thinking about your senses, the five senses, incorporating things that appeal to the senses in your worship, if you, even if you do that, that will already bring in more people, children included. So that can be visuals. What are the visuals you have? Do you have some kind of object um, at the front or uh, just things around the room? Are there things that you can have, like the sounds that you have? Are there things that you can have that you can touch or that you can smell? I mean, it doesn't mean that you will be able to do something that has all these things, but consider the senses. Consider just the, the atmosphere, the environment. Even that can already bring in um, more people um, in that. Um, the other thing that I would say on this is, and this, this is a question that's come up from, a, from some of you, is how do you include the youth? Or, you know, it might appeal to 
to some who are younger and maybe the families of them, but it, it loses the youth or other demographics aren't as engaged. That is something that I would say when you're looking at your worship service, there is, there is a lot that you can do to include everyone, but you have to have the thinking that this is not a children's service. So it's not about it being a service for children that adults are or parents are just kind of joining in on. It's a worship service. So how are you worshiping and proclaiming the message of God, but doing it in a way that, that there are accessible points for whatever age um, is there or whatever ability um, might be present in the room. So for example, you might choose your, you might ensure that your scripture passage or your theme for the morning is something that is multi-layered. You'll see a quote on the page if you read it that, that somebody described this kind of intergenerational ministry like a Pixar movie. There's, there's multi-layers to it. If you go to a Pixar movie, it's, it's animated movies maybe, maybe made for kids, but there are just as much um, adults out there enjoying it because there are elements in there that appeal to adults, whether it's humor or different things. So it, there's multi layers so that probably so that the parents who are having to go to these movies with their kids can get something out of it. That could be the thinking, but there are multi layers in that. Think of your worship service that way. So, for example, one scripture passage that uh, we had in one of our intergenerational worship services was the story of Jesus calming the storm. And that story, that's powerful. And so the way I did it is I had people on the spot just come up and kind of mime the story as I read um, the scripture passage. And so we assigned them parts and then just had them do whatever. I knew my community. I knew I could do that. So you have to know your context. Um, but I did that. And then I just asked them, the person who played Jesus, I just kind of asked questions on the spot. Again, I knew the people that were coming up, so I knew what I could do and not do. But the And I had some kids who came up with that, some, some of the older teens and adults who all kind of volunteered and did that, that story. Well, that story, and so it was across the whole theme, but that scripture and that service, that had a lot of layers in it, ones where kids could enter in because you talk about fears, you talk about, like there's different things in that, but it was something that also spoke to adults, to youth, because they, they saw the scripture, they, they listened, and then the different elements that we had in that service, there were different parts that were speaking to different ages, and so they were engaged. I didn't have, I didn't plan the service to be all like kid-friendly, things if you can like if you can kind of understand that they weren't all things that just little kids would like that's important in intergenerational worship it's not about just the kids in doing that there will be parts of it where children might not be as engaged so you have to be able to prepare parents for that, to help them, coach them, you know, what you're going to do with your kids, maybe give them permission and, and assistance in, you might have to answer questions, there might be, I would, what I would do with every intergenerational service I did is I would give a, like a, a really detailed script to parents ahead of time and say, here are the parts of the service where I think, you, like, younger children might not be as engaged, it's not really geared towards them, so here's what you could do, like, how you could help them to understand this piece because it's not just about like dumbing down and gearing it to the youngest person in there. It's about creating a worship experience where their multiple ages can, can um, enter into worship of God. Are there any questions at this point on, on the intergenerational worship? Nothing at this point, that's fine. Um, I'm, I'm not gonna touch on too much more on that. You can read more of some of my thoughts on it that I've given to you, but I wanna flip over to the events and then we'll get into actually planning some things. Uh, when it comes to intergenerational events, I've given you a resource on this as well. This is something we've put together to, to help some of our churches as they think about why would they do this and you know how could they actually do this. When it comes to intergenerational events, and this is true of worship as well, of anything, uh, one of the most important things I can say is you really want to consider who will be coming and, and the different ages. Again, just as with worship, it's not just about children. So it's not just about doing an event that kind of the youngest of children are going to be engaged in. It's about having variety and a multiple of ways for people to enter into a single theme. So you pick simple themes, both with worship and with events. You want to pick themes that, that are, are, are simple but are multi-layered. So it's not about being 
it's it's not about being like easy and kind of you know not shallow like it's it's something that's simple but that that has multiple levels to it um, can you think of an example of something a theme or a scripture does anything pop into your head yet Exactly. The big points of the, the church year, Christmas, Easter, those are great ways to have intergenerational events and worship times because there are so many levels that people enter into it and it's not just for one age category. Um, so that's a, that's a great way. One thing I'll mention, and this again applies to both worship and events, um, is you know involving people. So you want to, in your planning, Maybe you're the only person with the vision for this and you've got to inspire people and so you need to do a lot of work initially on it. But I would suggest that you start to build a team of people or gather together um, as you're thinking about the worship services or the events. I, that includes people of different generations. So if you're struggling with doing intergenerational events and engaging the youth in them because they seem too babyish or engaging different generations, make sure that you have youth and kids on your planning team. Not only to engage them, but also because you want to be learning from different perspectives of different generations. How, how could you, as whatever generation you represent, be able to come up with everything that might touch all or engage all the generations? You might not think of things because it's not part of your generational mindset or what you're interested in. So if you have a team of people who are planning that, not only will you probably increase engagement from different age levels, but you are going to get a much more beautiful kind of um, expression of intergenerational ministry. So with your events, if you're planning intergenerational events, then I, I would encourage you to see how can you balance out your team. Maybe you don't have, for example, maybe you don't have an eight-year-old who is part of the planning team and comes to all the meetings and does everything. Maybe that's not most effective because they just wouldn't be able to participate fully in that way. But you invite that eight-year-old or one of your classes, your grade two classes or something, you invite them to speak into a theme or maybe they choose a theme or, you know, if we were to, because um, kids who've grown up in church know a lot about scripture too. If we were to teach on Jesus calming the storm, like, what do you think? What do you think we, sh we should teach with that? What do you think we should do to express that story? So involve the perspectives of different generations. I think you'll have a much richer experience in your intergenerational events. Um, so think about that. Think about what you're asking of people. So a lot of times when we think of intergenerational, we think of highly active, very interactive, maybe different stations and you're moving around, hands on, you're doing all kinds of things. That um, might be a general characteristic of young children, like most young children are pretty interactive, but that is actually not true of every child and certainly not of every adult. When you think of, if you know about learning styles and that kind of thing, in multiple intelligences, when you're, when you're planning your events, think about that as well and having opportunities for kids. Sometimes there's kids, there's, there's adults who are really hands-on engaging, want to use their bodies and do physical things, but there are adults and children who prefer like knowing more, reading in a book, or um, having more quiet activities. So again, when you're thinking about intergenerational ministry, get out of your mind just the age segregation, but look at the different ways that people might connect in. So the different um, interest levels, the different intelligences of people, and do, is that represented? Again, that's not to say that you will have that in every event, but just be mindful and considerate of that. And as you're planning things, uh, to, to think of different ways that you can engage people regardless of age. And the beautiful thing with that is that's where you're going to get the multi-generational relationships happening. If you, have, For example, if you have an event where you have different stations of activities going on for a period of time, then you might have... Uh, three or four generations all around the craft table. It's all the people who are really crafty and like making, creating something. That's going to be beautiful because there's conversation happening, there's relationships, there might be a younger person getting to know someone that they didn't know before in the church who's older um, and they're, they're, there's a similar interest. So there's something that's non-threatening to kind of bring them together and do hands-on. And then you might have the, the 
some a different type of a station and again you're gathering people and it's more based on kind of their interests versus their ages and you're not making that determination ahead of time you're not saying these are all the kids activities and this is how the kids are so think about things that are going to be um, engaging for multiple generations not just kids have I stressed that enough not just it's not just about kids um, kids things that you're doing um, there's some practical ideas in, in these, these, both of these um, intergenerational worship and intergenerational events uh, sheets for you to look at. But I want to stop here because I want you to actually start to talk about it and then we'll discuss more and kind of wrestle through with the ideas yourself. Um, so what we're going to do is let's, let's do maybe, what do you think, four groups? I think four groups would make a good number. So I'm going to assign two groups to look at designing it kind of what would you put into a worship service and two that are going to be an event. So you decide where you want to go quickly. <laughs> uh, so we'll have two worship groups here, say on this side of the room, you can get up and move around, and two on events kind of on this side. So determine what you want. And I'm actually going to give you the theme or the passage. And we're going to spend about 10 minutes um, looking at what elements could you put into this. You can look at your handouts. What elements could you put into this to, yep, you can move. Start moving while I'm talking. Sorry. Yep. <laughs> um, that will, that could form some inter, not intergenerational worship expression. All right, so we've got worship over here. Okay, events, or do we just want two big groups? Would that be better? Two big groups. Let's just do two big groups. Okay, so you guys are worship. So I'm going to give you, you know what, I'll let you choose. You can either do the parable of the Good Samaritan or the lost coin. So choose one of those and then think through. That's your scripture passage focus for, for Sunday morning worship. I know you're coming from different churches, so try to think through what could be a service. So think through the elements. So not just what would be like the songs and that kind of thing, but what are other visual elements? Are there environment things that you could do to kind of help people enter into worship? Um, are there things that you could do in terms of the people that you're involved in leadership? Um, and just think through different elements of how you would, how we do that. And uh, I'm going to give you guys Advent as your topic. So an event that would be um, intergenerational around the theme of Advent. So think through what, what would your scripture focus or how would you communicate that? What would your theme, your main point, your theme be? And what are ways that you could create something um, for all ages to engage in? All right, let's all come back together now. <laughs> And, and let's share with each other your two different uh, intergenerational experiences. Now, I, I recognize as you're coming back together, 10 minutes to plan a worship service or an event is not really a lot of time and is not the reality, probably, of how you do things. But let's just hear kind of what some of your initial thoughts are and your considerations in planning your event. So maybe I'll invite uh, one person to share from each group. Who'd like to go? You want to share for your okay event? Tell us about your event, so or a few things about so, it. Um, we're told to plan about Advent, right? Mm -hmm. Something about Advent. So we decided, um, we decided that Advent is actually a time of preparing for Christ, as we wait for Christ. So the theme of the event will be prepared. Okay. So we have a sort of like something we'll call Advent Family Adventure, and we'll invite every body in the church to come participate, including people in the community. Community, be open to people in the community, and there will be lots of there will be different stations, and in different stations there will be wreath making. Like every family, we'll give every family like um, um, a wreath form where they can make advent wreaths that they will take home to decorate their homes. And also on other station, people could be making um, decorations for the church for Christmas, and um, there will be song like a simple song that everyone can sing together, like. Since it's Advent, the song like O Come, O Come Emmanuel, mm. like in an a cappella form. And for the word, <coughs> since it's preparing, maybe it could be like um, the passage in the Bible in Mark about John the Baptist saying, prepare the way of the coming of the Savior and everything. And we decided that the reading is going to be in a sort of mind, as you, you had told us about, like as the pastor or whoever is reading is reading, people can spontaneously act out the various 
that. He says that people of different um, generations who were called forward to like take on, to act out like whatever the story is. Mm. And the food would be like potluck. People would be told to bring whatever they're able to. And yeah, various stations, just a way to get everyone involved and to just be fun. One day event, we'll call it Advent. Okay, that's great. Any thoughts, feedback from, from others? What do you think? Any tips or things that you thought of as they're, as they're sharing their event? So in your church, what budget line does that come out of? It would come out of um, events, I guess, mm -hmm. or programs. Yeah, I think that's a good question when you're looking at intergenerational yeah. events and that. It might not, depending on how your budgeting works and that kind of thing. Um, yeah, that would be something that you probably have to determine if you're doing something like that. Or the other thing I would say is that um, are there ways to think through things that are not going to be huge budget lines? Um, I would suggest, again, like w simplify as much as possible. It's not so much about complicating and having lots of stuff, but what are ways that you can simplify but do it well, which is actually, to be honest, a lot more difficult to plan for and, and to do. Just like intergenerational worship, it actually takes a lot of work, but it shouldn't look like this complicated big production. Um, but yeah, so that's, uh, that's, a, that's some good ideas. A any other thoughts from the group of other elements you're thinking about as you're considering intergenerational? It's a great theme. It's a way people can engage. You have different stations. When it comes to an event, oftentimes what you'll find at intergenerational events is the idea of stations. So having multiple different things happening, but an opportunity for the generations to do things together. The only word of caution I would say in, in talking, and I heard this come out in terms of families could make a wreath together, is you want to be mindful of the fact that there will be people there without children, there'll be singles, there'll be seniors. When it comes to intergenerational ministry and events, it's important to think beyond just family. Family events could be something. That could be a separate thing where you're particularly programming for families to do things. But if you're thinking intergenerational, be very mindful of those um, that you want to include that are not bringing children or are part of a family. And how can you engage them in moving through activities or being a part of it without feeling like they're kind of missing out or the outsider <laughs> in something. So uh, worship, tell us about your worship service, whoever would like to speak to that. children, teenagers, well, maybe older children, teenagers, mm -hmm. adults, maybe even seniors, like as part of the worship team, right? And then having um, the same thing with like prayer and scripture, like not always just middle-aged adults doing that, but even on, on different Sundays, like it could be a senior, it could be a, a child, um, or someone had said even partnering a child with an older adult, that they do that together. It's a great idea. So mixing the song worship, doing dances or actions with the kids that they can participate with the worship. Um, in our lesson, um, reading the story and also acting it out and having different visuals for people. Um, as you're teaching the lesson, having a mini object lesson within your sermon that, you know, like it's so good to have an object that people can kind of, or kids especially, can mm -hmm. zone in on. Um, layering your point. So, like explaining different terms and ways that different generations can understand it and applying it to their situations okay. in their lives, right? Yep. Um, having discussion points, like times where they can discuss with their neighbors, question and answer periods. Did I miss something? I think that's pretty much it. Okay. A any other thoughts or any, any feedback or thoughts from the group who was planning an event? Breaks up your talking, so you're not just like lecturing, you're just talking to an audience. 
um, but also having time for them to stop and try and apply it to their own life. So discussing with their neighbors, um, doing an object lesson in your sermon. Um, like people at my church have done that before. So even if the kids have kind of zoned off, as soon as you bring out an object that you can relate to your sermon, then the kids are like, oh, like what is that? They're focused on back on in. Stage? Yeah. I think, I think you've shared some really good points in the sermon. When it comes to an intergenerational worship service, the sermon portion is probably the part that will differ the most in your worship service. So I said try to keep your liturgy relatively the same, but just think of the different. The sermon part, most of our churches have 20, 30 minute sermons. Would that be a typical kind of 40 minute sermon times where one person is up there talking? Maybe you have a Q&A time afterwards, maybe not, but it's generally kind of that. In an intergenerational service, you absolutely cannot do that at all. <laughs> um, you do want to break it up, but again, that doesn't mean you're, you could still have a 30 minute sermon, but it's broken up into segments with different things um, th that you're doing. And it doesn't have to be, it doesn't have to be any less meaningful or uh, deep than a sermon of some person. It, it's a particular way of preaching. Yeah. That was, yeah. They're very simple truths that we're teaching, but sometimes they're like, that was such a good reminder. And now every time I look at a pretzel, I think about praying. <laughs> yes, <laughs> yeah. So awesome. it's, it's true. And my experience with intergenerational services is that I have received the most like positive feedback from people who are not children or parents of children, but people who say, I got so much. I saw the scripture in a brand new way. On, on your, your handout about intergenerational worship, I have actually included the service order of a, one of service that I led at, um, at my previous church. And so it follows our liturgy. But if you look at the scripture and message time, it kind of models exactly what was, was just said. So the theme was all on thank you. And when we got to the, the message part, I asked, I started with asking a question. Um, has, a, has anyone ever gotten a present and the person like kind of took it and then didn't say thank you? And I just kind of threw that, out, threw that out there. I knew I could invite feedback right on the spot, so I let people shout out answers. That might be something you just say and let people think about for a moment. But then we went into the story of the 10, ten lepers, um, and that was our scripture basis. And so for this, again, I invited people up, and it was a mimed type of thing, and I did that, and I put people on the spot of saying, like, Jesus, how did you feel with the one? Or no, I didn't do that part. I just said, you know, I asked um, um, the person who said thank you, the leper I assigned to say thank you, like, what did... What what did, you, what did you think? Why did you come back? Why did you say that? Then what I did is I invited the congregation to, to turn to each other and talk about, you know, what do you think that Jesus would have thought about the person who came back and said thank you? So that was their way to engage, but any age can do that. So kids might have the way that they might answer in their family groups or with others, but adults can think about that too. And so it's not dumbing down the message, it's just not the preacher telling you everything about the passage. I gave some background information to leprosy and customs and that at the beginning, but it's not one person telling you everything. It's actually putting the scripture out there and then, okay, now what, as you think about this, what do you think? And then, and then I invited people back and then I shared for a few, few minutes and I, I engaged some people to share what they thought, but then I said a few things and a few thoughts and then we moved into a response activity. And again, a response activity that is accessible regardless of your age. So in this case, I had a picture of a man kneeling at Jesus' feet. Um, uh, who'd been the person um, healed of, of um, leprosy. And then I just had sticky notes at each pew, two different colored ones. And I invited people to respond by writing something on their sticky note, or if they weren't a writer, to get help to put something, and then they could come forward. So one was a thank you kind of thing for, for God, and one was something that we need, want to pray about. And it tied into the, the words that I had shared. But again, that is something that it doesn't matter what age you are. You can enter in and engage with that. So when it comes to worship, and to, to the teaching portion of it, you just you want to look for ways and to have variety of things to break down your teaching time and have activities and think through things that, again, are simple but are not just geared at one age group or simplified to the point that some people are just going to feel like it's too babyish. Um, finding things that work for all ages. 
we, um, we've run out of time, so there's not a lot more we can do. And there wasn't a lot of time to really interact with things, but I hope that you've gotten some thinking going on intergenerational worship. Uh, look through the resources. One thing I would say is that when you're thinking about this too, there are so many things that if you're not a creative person, there are so many resources that you can look to to give you ideas. And you don't have to spend money on, you can purchase things, but there are lots of things that you can find online. Um, part of my role is I'm looking for things and then making them available. So you can, my information is on there. You can always go to, to my website that I do um, with my job um, or email me if you want the list. Uh, I work, a lot of my churches are run by volunteers, so the reason list that I put together is geared to the person who can't spend hours Googling thing, certain topics or that. So I try to pull the best of different things. So feel free to email and I can pass that on to you. Messy Church, if anyone knows Messy Church, and I know we have one, one person at least who's, who's doing that, starting that, uh, Messy Church is intergenerational as part of its value. You can even look on their site and what they have for ideas if you're wanting to do events. There are great resources there and there's a lot of things that are available free online. But there's other websites and, and that as well. Um, and gather people together to think through what could intergenerational, a lot of it is what are the questions you're asking. And even in your times, questions and having a response activity, asking the right question is the way that you're going to engage people in your teaching um, and, and help them to respond regardless of age because they will answer that in whatever way it, it makes sense to them at their age. So, you know, you talk about bullying. Everybody experiences it in some way. You can ask a question, have you ever felt like somebody has been mean to you unfairly? Well, a child can immediately probably think of an example, but so can an adult, so can a senior. You can think maybe in workplace, some of us deal with difficult workplaces. You can probably think of examples. It's the question you're asking. So when you're looking at topics, so there's a lot that you can do with intergenerational, but you do, it really requires a lot of thinking around how, how do people, regardless of age, ability, stage, um, stage of their spiritual life, you know, how do they enter into what God is saying about this theme or this passage of scripture. Um, feel free to email me. I'm happy to answer other questions. I think I probably touched on everything that was given to me, um, uh, but if you want more, uh, I'm happy to hear from you. And I encourage you in your journey with intergenerational ministry and worship. It's such a great thing. One other thing I wanted to just mention, this is one of the best books if you're looking to know more about it or more of the theoretical side or like the reasoning why or wanting to convince. This is one of the best texts out there that talk about intergenerational Christian formation. Um, there's some great resources there and, and you'll find some websites. There's some great um, lists in here too. So I would recommend that book um, there when it comes to more of the background of why would you do this and, and how can this happen. Um, that's a great one. So this is Intergenerational Christian Formation. Um, Holly Catherine Allen and Christy Lawton Ross. I'll leave it up here if you want to come take a look or take a picture of it so you can look that up later. Um, let me pray for us just as you leave and we're heading into our final session in about uh, 10 minutes, I think. Um, so let's pray. Uh, Lord, we give you thanks for this time that we've had this afternoon and for this day that we've been able to come together. And God, I pray your blessing over each one of the leaders here in this room and their passion and desire for intergenerational ministry. God, we are thankful that you give us one another, that you teach us and draw us towards yourself through um, different ages and different ways. And God, I pray your blessing on these leaders as they continue in their journey of developing and leading and creating intergenerational worship and ministry experiences. May you give them insight and wisdom, creativity and discernment as they lead in their contexts. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.